Thank you, Helen. Thank you, others. This is, of course, a high point of the RD conference, and I'm very honored to be uh, allowed to introduce the Dudley Sears lecture and our speaker, Francois Bourguignon, and the two match brilliantly. I'm just going to say a few words to remind those of you who don't remember that much about Dudley, first president, of course, of IADI, and a major figure in development. I won't ask, uh, hands up, those of you who've been uh, very deeply influenced by his writings. One of the earliest things he wrote uh, was the meaning of development. He said the key questions to ask of a country was what has been happening to poverty, what has been happening to uh, employment, what has been happening to income distribution. If two or three of these are moving in good directions, then surely the country is developing. If, he said, two or three are moving in the wrong direction, even if GNP growth has doubled, it would be odd, Dudley said, to call it development. That affected a lot of us. Dudley then was a structuralist uh, in IDS in 75. We started an MPhil on development studies. It was based on looking at the structure and uh, historical record of development of pairs of countries, Brazil and uh, Mexico, I think it was, Chile and Argentina, was it? Russia and the USS, uh, USSR and the United States, India and China. You need to look at the structures of countries, Dudley taught us. The students complained. The students, they didn't mind looking at uh, the structures of countries. They thought that was very exciting. But why are we always going overseas in IDS? Why not look at something that's happening in Britain? And Dudley said, OK, let's go to Scotland. Scotland had just discovered oil. And Dudley, of course, got the students, with a little help from himself, to publish a document on North Sea oil and the experience of developing countries that could illuminate the problems Scotland was going to face. One of the major conclusions, as I recall, was that political things are going to happen in Scotland. Well, those have been <laughs> rather prescient. It was interesting, and many people may have forgotten that by mid-70s, Dudley no longer worked on developing countries. He's, he didn't like the emotions. He said we need to, as, as Emmanuel said, we need to study development in our own backyard. That was Emmanuel's phrase, not Dudley's. But... Dudley then started working on underdeveloped Europe. And a succession of books uh, emerged on that. Well, um, emphasizing particularly the European periphery. If I, Dudley's final book, still worth looking at, The Political Economy of Nationalism, rather surprised us the uh, title, published uh, just after he died, he has two bits that I remember from that very, very, one very often, which was a very self-aware comment. He said, I've only worked in 36 countries in my life, um, and already that's less than a quarter of the world. So I have a very limited view. And he went on saying, I'd never worked in India or China, big countries. I have a bias in my limited views, and so forth. Um, it's worth asking ourselves, how is our perspective? <laughs> how many of us have worked in 30, Dudley in 36 countries? Dudley said, by that I mean in the country for at least a month doing a solid piece of professional work. And the other thing which I think is very relevant uh, on inequality, that Dudley said the left right division is very outmoded. And he said one ought to have a fourfold division politically in which one looks at the egalitarian, inegalitarian policies or ambitions of a government 
and the national or the international focus. Very relevant and uh, I think very wonderful. Well, that shows why Dudley has been, Dudley was talking about many of these issues uh, and actually so was our speaker tonight. Francois, I've known Francois for a, not that well, but for quite a while until I read his CV today in detail. It's, re it's really, you need, need to, I'll give you a final quote on that. But, of course, we all now know of the Paris School of Economics, of which Francois was the director, and actually taught, let me emphasize, Piketty. <laughs> and Francois has that modesty that he doesn't say, well, I actually got Piketty focused directly on the inequality issue. But Francois himself, in the 1960s, in 1970s and early 80s, when I'm not sure whether Piketty was born or whether he was just, <laughs> or whether he was just in primary school. But anyway, Francois did a paper on income distribution worldwide. He did studies on, for ILO and OECD on income inequality and trends distribution models in Colombia, uh, Venezuela. Impressive. And for those of you who feel that um, once a person has gone down the narrow path of economic, uh, of um, mathematical economics, there's no hope. Just listen to this. In 1981, I'm not going to ask people to stand up if they can understand it, Pareto, this is a published article in Econometrica, Pareto's superiority of unegalitarian equilibria in Stieglitz's model of wealth distribution, hang on, with convex saving functions. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not sure whether anyone else in this room, whether anyone else in this room, <laughs> but, there is uh, five pages of other articles that many of us could read and understand uh, <laughs> that, um, that were... But not just um, his articles. Um, Francois has been an activist, policy maker. He's worked for OECD, with Louis, of course, with wider. From 9 to 2003 to 7, he was chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. Very interesting, and he was just telling me that uh, uh, Wolfensohn was the one who was open then to inequality, and I hope that those of you who have been reading the World Development Report will realize it was 2006, I think, when the first one on income distribution, uh, distribution and development came out absolutely. But, rightly so, Francois has been um, moving up the scale of awards, which is also impressive. I don't fully understand them all. But um, the Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Mérité in 1991. Oh, there, come on, that's just a beginning. <laughs> yes. And then the Chevalier, the Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Légion d'Honneur. 2010, and you got a Médaille de Bronze in 1982, a Médaille d'Argent in 1997, but I couldn't find in these six pages anything about the gold. <laughs> so anyway, well, when one needs to read, if it has such a distinguished and reads such a distinguished CV, there's only one honest reaction from fellow academics green with envy. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I ask Francois Bourguignon to give the Dudley Sears lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for these very nice uh, words. I'm afraid I will not be as witty as you are, and uh, I'm afraid also that I don't have the same fabulous accent that uh, you have to speak English. Uh, 
but uh, simply one uh, footnote. This paper you referred to was a great paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in any case, it's a very uh, a great pleasure to be here today, and I uh, thank very much the organizers to invi for inviting me to give this uh, prestigious uh, lecture. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I attended already uh, AID uh, conferences uh, a long time ago. I think I was uh, uh, in, in the first uh, sets of uh, conferences. I was even uh, heading a working group. Uh, and in those days, it was already a working group on inequality. Uh, and uh, some bifurcation uh, took place. And uh, it's uh, very good to be uh, here today and uh, to be back uh, in the loop and uh, to see how well uh, EAD uh, did and how well uh, EAD is, is, is doing. Now, you may wonder what the 50 uh, years here uh, stand for, whether it is a kind of hidden anniversary. Uh, I've not been working in uh, this area for 50 years yet, uh, so it's not an anniversary. Uh, it really refers to the fact that when we talk about the development these days, it is very difficult not to talk about uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, independence in sub-Saharan Africa really starts in uh, 1960, and a little later for the uh, English uh, uh, former colonies. Uh, and because of that, I think that it makes sense, given the number of uh, uh, African countries in among developing countries, it makes sense to really start analyzing what has been going on in development and development economics uh, in, in, in those days. But there is another reason why uh, uh, going back to the 60s is important. And the reason is precisely uh, the uh, writing, writing by uh, the Lessiers, uh, many of them which uh, refer to or uh, go back to that uh, time. Uh, I must say that uh, in these days, uh, I was uh, a young uh, uh, economist. Uh, as uh, uh, Richard said, I was uh, very obsessed, captivated, passionate uh, for uh, economic modeling and uh, mathematical modeling in particular. And I, I met uh, Dudley Sears uh, probably in the late 70s at a meeting which took place in uh, IDS, and I think that Richard was uh, the head of IDS in, uh, in those days. And I must say that uh, I didn't get really the message that uh, uh, Dudley Sears was, uh, was sending. I mean, his view about the his, uh, uh, stress on the fact that uh, development economics had to go beyond uh, national income and national income growth uh, I didn't get it. And it took me a very, very long time to realize that, uh, yes, he was definitely right. And it took a very long time to many people in the profession to realize that uh, he was right. And the itinerary or the, the journey that I made to get to that conclusion is really summarized in this uh, subtitle for this uh, uh, lecture, From Growth to Growth and Equity. Uh, for me, it has been exactly that. I mean, I started as a kind of mathematical economist working on growth uh, and uh, progressively and also at some stage working on inequality without really putting them together. And much later on, I tried to do that, to put together inequality and growth, and I could see that uh, it, it was true that we could not analyze development as more than aggregate growth without getting into inequality, without getting into uh, poverty. So from that point of view, I think that uh, I made a journey in uh, uh, economic analysis which uh, goes in the direction of uh, Dudley Sears. The only thing is what uh, he was uh, uh, 40 years ahead of me. He was a little uh, older than me also. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, start with, uh, with a quote by Dudley Sears. Richard uh, made one quote. This one is uh, slightly longer, but I think it is quite strong and uh, quite uh, revealing. We have misconceived the nature of the main challenge of the second half of the 20th century. This was written in 1969, and this is the same paper, The, mean, the Meaning of Development. This has been seen as achieving an increase in the national income of developing countries, formalized in the growth rate set for the first development decade. Of course, we are well aware 
that development consists of much else besides economic growth. Yet little more than lip service is paid to it, we are still setting targets mainly or only for the national income. It is now time to make the point more sharply. And uh, you can understand that uh, after this kind of quote, the most natural question which comes to mind is 40 years later, how did European economics evolve? And is it okay that we were able to deal with this agenda that uh, Dudley Sears uh, put uh, before, before us? And more precisely, I would like to see whether poverty and income distribution, which uh, were key non-GDP dimensions stressed by Dudley Sears, have been dealt with. And it is quite important because behind poverty and income distribution, we can feel that uh, many social aspects of development are there. So if we are able to integrate growth and inequality or income distribution in a, a rather uh, convincing way, at the same time we should be able to integrate economic income and non-economic or non-income aspects of development, which as a matter of fact was the goal. So this is what I will try to summarize in this lecture by reviewing what happened in these areas over the last uh, half century. Here is the outline of the uh, lecture, and you will see that immediately I will contradict myself, and I will look first at growth per se, aggregate growth. Why uh, do I want to do that? Simply because of two reasons. One is whether we have a very broad view about development, as including not only economic goals, uh, income, uh, uh, monetary income goals, but also other aspects of development in the life of uh, the people, we need more resources. And uh, those resources will be generated by growth. So uh, we may say, and this was a point made by the Lessier, that uh, uh, growth of uh, uh, national income or GDP is not sufficient to generate uh, development. But uh, I believe that it is a necessary condition. And because of that, it is worth analyzing uh, this. And the second reason is simply that even with this, let's call it simple, although it is certainly not simple, as we will see, uh, objective of analyzing uh, uh, aggregate uh, development, if uh, I can use uh, this word, we'll see that a lot of uh, things have been going on. Our understanding of the way in which we should be looking at aggregate growth has changed quite a lot over time, and this is what I would like to review to show where we stand today in comparison where, where we stood uh, 40 years or 50 years ago. And the second part will be focused on inequality, the second key dimension of development, according to Dudley Sears and according to myself. And there I will look at uh, first the relationship between income inequality, poverty, growth. Uh, income inequality may not be the right word. I should have written inequality. And when we'll get, back, when we'll get to this, you'll see that the definition of inequality, inequality of what, is something which matters a lot. And I will end up uh, considering a recent development in the economic development literature which has to do with the relationship between inequality of opportunities and uh, development. And then I will very, uh, conclude very briefly. To start with, let's look at some development performances. I don't want to get into a detailed descriptive analysis of what has been going on, but uh, out of these uh, charts, I would like uh, later on to draw some interesting uh, conclusions. Here you have the chart of uh, GDP per capita expressed in uh, 2005 uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, we know that there is now a new uh, uh, reference in purchasing power parity, which is 2011, and this is producing a lot of changes. I will not talk about that uh, uh, today. What we observe in those curves, which go from 1960 to 2010 or 2012, more exactly, that those curves are, as a matter of fact, quite uh, satisfactory in the sense they're all increasing. And it is okay that in uh, uh, 2012, 
uh, everybody in all uh, uh, regions uh, are uh, better off in terms of GDP per capita than in 1960. Uh, and uh, in some cases, the, the change is quite uh, spectacular. When you look at East Asia, for example, a little less when we look at uh, South Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, in the case of Africa, in particular, we can see that the uh, change is positive, but it is very, very small. Uh, overall, between 1960 and 2012, uh, GDP per capita in Africa increased by uh, less than 30%, which is, uh, let's say, the rate of growth, which is around 0.5% a year, which is very, very, very low uh, if we want uh, to look at uh, development. But overall, the picture is rather positive. Now, if we change the lens uh, or the thermometer, and we say, okay, now, instead of looking at this in absolute terms, let's look at those curves in relative terms using as a benchmark the income of the richest countries in the world. After all, development is something like catching up. We would like developing countries to progressively catch up with uh, rich countries. Now, what is the uh, performance when we do that? Here are the same pictures, but now we have not uh, uh, GD, uh, dollars uh, in the PPP 2005 on the vertical axis. Now we have the GDP of a country, per capita of a country, in relation to uh, the United States. And the picture would be more or less the same if we were to take uh, to pick up uh, some uh, European countries. And here you see that the results are quite different. Now we have declining curves for Latin America, very uh, a sharply declining curve for Africa, so definitely those countries lost with respect to the richest countries in the world throughout the period. And we have an increase in uh, East Asia, of course, led by uh, China, and in uh, South Asia, but really uh, at uh, the end of the period, uh, uh, or a very slow growth rate in uh, the uh, middle of the period. And over the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, it is true that things are going better. Uh, and uh, when you compare uh, 2012 to uh, uh, 1998 or something like that, you find that indeed there is a huge uh, uh, improvement. And this is the reason why everybody is saying today things are going very well in the developing world. But if you have this very long run view, you have to conclude that Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa have lost with respect to rich countries. And it is something that we want to keep in mind. If we define development uh, in general as poor countries catching up with the rich countries, this is certainly not a success. And the last chart I would like to show is already on the side of uh, Dudley Sears, looking already at poverty rather than aggregate income. And there are two uh, lessons that we'd like to draw from this uh, uh, chart. Here we have the version of poverty since 1980, we don't have uh, good data before 1980 because uh, since 1990, uh, 1980, we can uh, rely on household surveys which are more or less consistent across countries and over time. And uh, what you observe first in, uh, those, uh, in this chart is that if you were to relate that chart to the previous one, you would see that the correlation with GDP per capita is really very strong. If you look at Africa, for example, or Latin America, you will find that these curves, uh, which represent the proportion of people below $1.25 a day, the very standard poverty line used uh, these days, uh, you'll see that uh, there is a, a, a perfect correlation with the evolution of uh, national um, income per, per capita. So this is in uh, uh, the line of what I was saying before that, uh, GDP growth is important as a kind of necessary condition for uh, development. But the other remark we can make on this uh, uh, chart is that, that, again, we see that Africa and Latin America are not performing very well. The change in poverty in uh, Africa uh, between 1960 and, uh, 19, and 2012, uh, 2010 more exactly, is a drop in the uh, percentage of poor people from 52 to 48. It's not a big deal. And uh, when you compare, of course, to uh, East Asia, where this uh, same proportion went from a little less than 80% to a little more than uh, 10%. So 
Uh, here again, we see that there is an asymmetry in the world. Uh, some regions do very well. We have to remember that East Asia is very much influenced, of course, by what uh, is happening in China, but we have other countries doing very well, like uh, Indonesia or Vietnam, uh, and other regions doing uh, rather uh, badly or uh, uh, stagnating more than uh, developing. Okay, so this is the evidence that we have. This is the uh, way in which the uh, developing regions have fared over the last 50 years. Now, what I want to do now is to use the same charts and show that very clearly there are three stages in those charts. Uh, and Latin America is probably the best uh, uh, illustration of those stages. Growth in the uh, first stage, 1960-1982, and 1982, the uh, debt crisis in Latin America and in uh, Africa. Africa has peaked a little earlier than Latin America, and growth has not been as strong in Africa as in Latin America, but we have very parallel evolutions, and we have very, very slow growth in uh, East Asia and South uh, uh, Asia. Then the second period is a period of stagnation, the uh, 80s and uh, the uh, good part of the 90s, where uh, uh, GDP per capita is uh, growing very, very slowly in Latin America. It is going down big time in uh, Africa. And at the same time, we have the takeoff of uh, East Asia and uh, at a much more modest uh, pace in uh, South Asia. And at the end of this period, Again, we have a crisis. We have the Asian crisis in 1997. Uh, it is represented here by uh, 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 the fact that between 1997 and 1998, there was no growth in East Asia. So it is not as big as the 1982 crisis in Latin America, but the crisis is there, and it is important to insist on this. And the last period is a period that everybody has in mind these days uh, with some kind of optimism, saying that uh, uh, a new takeoff has uh, taken place in the developing world and all the countries are growing more or less uh, at the same time and at a very fast pace. Again, East Asia is growing faster than the others and this is also true now of uh, South Asia. Now what is interesting is the fact that those three periods in terms of uh, the way in which the global economy to some extent uh, worked correspond to three different approaches to development. And what I would like to do now is to look at the characteristics in terms of the approach that the way in which we were looking at development in those days, uh, the kind of economic analysis which was done on development in those days, and the performances with a little more detail that uh, were obtained in those days. In the first period, which went very well, the general approach was planning. And it was uh, uh, essentially the state responsible for moving, for pushing development ahead uh, with a very uh, uh, discretionary or voluntarist approach, including import substitution. Uh, the public sector was definitely prominent in the way in which uh, development was uh, being sought. The implicit model in those days was very simple. If you want to develop, what you need, you need resources. You need to accumulate capital. You need to accumulate physical capital. You need to accumulate uh, human capital. And if we are able to do that, then by definition, the economy will grow. The uh, focus of economic analysis in those days, these were my days, where I was building those crazy models, uh, were uh, growth models, Arad Domar, Solo, one sector, multi-sector, optimal growth, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the whole view was planning. We were assuming that there would be some benevolent uh, uh, dictator or uh, uh, ruler that uh, would, uh, who would simply implement what these models were saying. What were the performances of the economy? As you can see on the chart, they were very good. In those days, we were talking about miracles. But the miracles were not only in Asia. You had the Brazilian miracle for almost uh, 10 years. Brazil grew at rates which, were, uh, which would be qualified as Chinese today. Côte d'Ivoire was doing extremely well, much better than all the neighboring countries in, uh, in uh, West Africa. 
Korea, of course, was uh, probably the, 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 the champion. And the uh, growth of the miracle continued in Korea, unfortunately stopped in the other countries, and we are not clear about what happened. Was it okay that the model uh, runs out of steam? That uh, all what the government could do through planning had been done, and then this was the end, then we had to change the regime? Uh, or was it okay that a crisis occur uh, because of uh, the change in uh, international prices of uh, uh, commodities, in particular oil, because of uh, monetary issues at the global level, the huge increase in the rate of interest in 1982 in uh, the US with uh, very indebted uh, developing countries? We don't really know, but in any case, the uh, period came to, to a stop. And another characteristic of that period is that we have a lot of asymmetry across regions. We always have Latin America and Africa on the one hand, and we have the Asian countries, South and uh, East or Southeast, in, on, on the other. The second stage is the stage of structural adjustment. As the end take off, and at the end, the financial crisis in Asia and in some other countries. In those the general approach has completely changed. We have a very strong paramedic, paradigmatic change, a liberal turn. Uh, we move from state uh, control to market uh, freedom. And these are the unfortunate days of the Washington uh, consensus. Maybe not because the Washington consensus was uh, stupid, it was not, but simply because it was applied in such a blind way that uh, it led to uh, very big mistakes made in uh, several countries, not only big, but uh, very uh, dramatic mistakes made in uh, different countries. The implicit model has changed. Then people have realized that accumulation cannot be decided uh, by a government. Uh, accumulation is a result of some behavior by economic agents, and then the role of the government is to find the policy that will give incentives to the agents to accumulate uh, in the right way, that is, to accumulate the right amount and to uh, allocate that right amount correctly among uh, different uh, sectors. So there is one step further in the analysis. Now we are looking at uh, how to influence the accumulation process rather than how to control directly the accumulation process. The focus of economic analysis in those days is cross-country analysis of growth determinants and role of economic policies. Cross-country regressions is the name of the game uh, in uh, those days. Everybody is playing that game. Uh, the results that uh, they obtain are rather disappointing. At the end, uh, they don't find a, a universal recipe. They find that uh, growth is something very, very complex, which depends heavily on the context, which depends heavily on the country specificity, and we simply don't have enough data, enough observations to be able to cross uh, country uh, specific characteristics with policies in order to see the way in which this interaction is uh, producing more or uh, uh, less uh, growth. So I would say that uh, at the end, this uh, huge uh, uh, effort was not really very, uh, uh, very uh, successful. Performances. Disappointing growth in uh, uh, Latin America and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the big change, the uh, structural adjustment which was imposed by the uh, uh, IMF, by the World Bank, didn't produce uh, a big uh, acceleration of growth, didn't produce a fast recovery, as you can see on those pictures. It was more stagnation than anything else, and the stagnation uh, lasted uh, some 15 years. So it is more than a, a missing a recovery. Then at the end of the period, or at the middle of the period, big financial crisis, Mexico 1994, the famous tequila uh, crisis, with a contagion in uh, uh, other countries in the world. In 1907, the Asian crisis, with again contagion in uh, other parts of the world. And in the case of Asia, uh, a big problem the sent linked to the Washington consensus to the liberal turn with the fact that today we 
Uh, and even in those days, we knew very well that one part of the problem was to have opened up the capital account and to have, to f to have freed uh, capital movements. And we also know today that the uh, intervention by the IMF in those days was uh, completely uh, opposite to what uh, should have been done, simply because they didn't take into account the context of that economy and they applied blindly some principles or some rules that they had decided on their experience in Latin America, but Latin America is not Asia and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, and again, a symmetry across region, because at the same time we see that East Africa, East Asia, is really taking off, uh, and uh, uh, not yet really in uh, South Asia, but there are progresses being made in South Asia. And the last period is the 2000s, and the question about the 2000s is, growth is picking up. Is it a turn in the global economy and for developing regions, or is it simply a bright spell? And uh, at some stage in uh, the near future, in the uh, coming five or maybe ten years, then we might be back to uh, a period of uh, a much less uh, buoyant uh, growth. So the general approach is a lot of continuity with the previous stage, with a small difference, with the fact that because of the Asian crisis, because of Mexico, because of several uh, accidents of this type, people realize that markets were not... Uh, as bright as they thought uh, they uh, would be. And uh, because of that, we are really getting back slowly to a more balanced view about the fact that uh, there are market failures in the same way as there are state failures. Very important uh, evolution is the focus which is put on governance. Uh, some people say the reason why the Washington consensus in many countries failed to uh, re uh, 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 vive uh, growth was well, simply because the institutions in those countries were not adequate. I don't know exactly what uh, this meant. I don't think that they had a very strong evidence of that. But one point is uh, sure is that the fact that uh, since uh, the end of the 90s, there have been a big emphasis on the role of institutions, that is, the role of governance in uh, uh, development. And then we have, of course, uh, uh, in that period, the MDG initiative which is maybe something else. The implicit model that people have since the, uh, this period is now go going one step further. Uh, initially, we had accumulation is causing development. Then we had, no, it's accumulation you cannot control. You have to have the right policies which will incentivize people to accumulate. And now the whole thing goes one step further. You need to have the right institutions which will decide about the right policies which will incentivize people to accumulate and which will produce uh, growth. This is where we are. We can find this uh, as mechanical and uh, maybe naive. Uh, I think that uh, the emphasis put on institutions over the last uh, 10 to 15 years is something important. And uh, I believe that many of you uh, today had the experience in several countries about the role of institutions, the role of bad governance, the role of predatory elites and uh, their impact or the kind of uh, uh, impossibility theorem which comes from their presence in terms of uh, development. The focus of economic analysis in the recent past has changed quite a lot. Two priorities, of course the role of the institutions, and uh, you certainly know the recent book by uh, Asimoglu and uh, Robinson on uh, why nations fail, which is the, uh, the outcome of a very uh, deep uh, reflection on the role of institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, another uh, big change with respect to the previous period is the fact that there are not so many people working anymore on macro and growth. People now started to work on micro issues and with a very strong experimental focus trying to uh, see what uh, is working, not working in terms of interventions against the poverty at the micro level. And all this work on the randomized controlled trials, this work around the uh, JPAL uh, um, lab in uh, uh, MIT with uh, Esther Duflo and uh, Abhijit Banerjee, uh, this is something big and uh, this corresponds to that evolution. Uh, it is not clear at this stage whether we can 
put this and uh, uh, reconcile this with some macro issues, but it is, we have to simply take act of the fact that this is something important these days. Performances are good, very fast growth. Some people say this is because the uh, Washington consensus worked. Countries have learned that what the good policies were, and now they are doing well. I think it is a very optimistic view. Another view is to say, terms of trade have not been as good in those countries since uh, the 70s, where those countries were growing very fast. And uh, from that point of view, there may be uh, something behind that. Those countries are growing because terms of trade are good. I think that there is some truth in both parts. Now the problem is to know uh, uh, how much of each truth uh, there is. Another interesting thing is the fact that the Asian crisis showed that countries may have a lot of resilience. Uh, we knew in, in, we said in those days, look, uh, Korea is a country that is they're saving a lot. Uh, they will go over this crisis very quickly uh, uh, because essentially the fundamentals are sound for development. And yes, they did it. They, go, they went through it rather quickly. Indonesia took a little more time because you had the political problems of uh, one uh, uh, predatory uh, regime uh, going down and being replaced by a more democratic regime. But at the end, uh, there was a, a lot of resilience in, uh, in, in, in the area. And then the final thing is we have uh, been, we have seen uh, 12 years, 15 years of uh, generalized growth in all uh, developing regions and convergence of all this region with respect to the richest countries in the world. This is the first time this is happening, probably since the early 19th century. Now, again, whether it will last is another story. Now, what are the lessons learned out of this? No universal recipe. This is uh, clear. No silver bill bullet. There are market failures, or there are government failures, and we have to deal with them. Uh, maybe uh, in some countries, one type of failure is more important than another type, but in any case, uh, we cannot rely on markets in the same way as we cannot rely exclusively on governments because of uh, institutions, because of governance, because of political economy. Uh, with the same, uh, uh, same consequence of univers no universal recipe, a lot of country specificity. And the only thing we can do in analyzing the uh, constraints or the determinants of growth is really to try to uh, uh, identify the specific failures which are respons or constraints which are responsible for the fact that a given country is not able to grow faster and uh, in a more sustainable way. Now, this does not mean that we didn't learn anything. This does not mean that there is no general lessons. Uh, it is clear that uh, there are some necessary conditions for uh, uh, favorable uh, development and growth. Uh, good and uh, reasonable fiscal and monetary policies is a, a, a must. Uh, a country which is uh, having 40% uh, inflation uh, every year uh, might not uh, make it. And uh, when we look uh, today at Argentina, which is progressively uh, increasing its uh, rate of inflation from uh, uh, 5% uh, uh, six years ago to uh, 12% and today to 25%, more, more, even more than that, and uh, not uh, uh, publishing that uh, the, rate of the rate of inflation is so high. We know that uh, this country is bound to have another uh, crisis, and this is the kind of thing that we learn from uh, the past, and many countries learn that. The fact that any country should be reasonably open, this does not mean that it has to uh, eliminate all possible barriers, but in a uh, rather uh, um, uh, selective way to eliminate some barriers in order to be able to grow or to develop some kind of competitiveness in some areas. Again, this is something which is, I think, a kind of uh, necessary condition and general uh, and common wisdom. There are also weak principles saying that if uh, uh, an activity can be uh, uh, handled by the private sector under a condition of competition, then uh, it is better than to uh, have the public sector uh, uh, operating these uh, kind of activities. 
All this is fine, but it does not lead us uh, very, very well. Another uh, uh, point is the fact that because of uh, the micro uh, focus, we have an expanding catalog of impact evaluations of poverty-oriented programs, which are extremely useful. Uh, when uh, um, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee uh, have this paper saying microcredit is a, brick, is a bright idea, but when we look at uh, the uh, impact of microcredit in several countries, in particular in India and also in Morocco, we find no strong evidence that uh, this has contributed to reducing poverty in those countries. So maybe microcredit, but it may come, it must come with something else. Now let's look at what the something else uh, should be. This is extremely valuable, and uh, from that point of view, there is certainly a huge progress being made in development economics. And the uh, last point is, of course, the importance of institutional constraints and its implications. And uh, from that point of view, I would like to um, tempted to cite or to transform the uh, famous uh, sentence, uh, it's economic stupid, which was uh, 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 said by uh, 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 an advisor to Clinton during his uh, presidential campaign, I would say the opposite, it's a politics stupid. And uh, uh, when I left the World Bank, uh, when I got into the World Bank, I said, okay, development is an economic issue. I've been working on this for many, many years. I know that. And when I left the bank, I said, okay, I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> Development uh, is uh, very, very much a political issue. Let me, <coughs> I'm, uh, I did uh, to take very, too, too much time. Uh, how much time do, 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 do I have still? Press ahead. <laughs> Press ahead. Okay, I'll uh, try to go quickly on all this. Uh, let's look at the way in which income inequality, poverty, uh, got into the picture that I just uh, de described. Income inequality came to the forefront in the 70s uh, uh, with this uh, very famous uh, uh, book and set of papers, Redistribution with Growth. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. Actually, <laughs> there, Dudley said he didn't want his name associated with that. The Dudley name is not there. Okay, fine, but uh, he was also behind that. But, uh, in, I mean, yes, intellectually, yes, no, 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 he just, was behind that. Yes, okay. we're adding the finer points to this. <laughs> okay, and sorry about uh, the misspelling. Uh, okay. There is an actress, I think, with, with this kind of name. <laughs> uh, this was much less visible during the structural adjustment. What was interesting in the redistribution with growth, it was very much motivated by the experience of Brazil. Uh, you know, you had this miracle in Brazil, and some people analyzing uh, uh, census data in Brazil found that poverty might have increased in Brazil during the miracle rather than decreased. At the end, we discovered that it was not uh, uh, that clear and the data were not really uh, very good. But this triggered this uh, 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 reflection on uh, uh, redistribution with growth, and I think it was uh, something important. So it was less visible during the structural adjustment. It came back at a certain stage in, 19, in the 90s uh, because of the uh, reflection on inequity, inequality and growth. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And today, it is increasingly present uh, not only because of uh, my colleague uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, but because really it seems to be raising uh, very uh, sharply in a number of countries, especially among the uh, globalizing countries, among the countries like China, Indonesia, uh, uh, India, uh, the inequality is definitely increasing quickly. It was increasing in the 80s and 90s in Latin America. Now, since the early 2000s, it seems to be decreasing uh, a bit. What is a long-run uh, uh, trend? It is not clear. Now, there are three points I would like to uh, look at within a connection with inequality. Uh, there are three ways we can consider inequality within a development framework. First, we can say inequality is good per se, and we should pursue less inequality. Sorry, inequality is bad per se. <laughs> and we should pursue 
less inequality, whatever the situation is. The second one is to say inequality is instrumental. It's good, it is bad per se, but less inequality is also an instrumental because it will allow growth to be more effective in reducing poverty, which is a big argument. And the third argument to say that less inequality is also instrumental because it may be the case that less inequality will be promoting faster growth. And these were the uh, uh, areas which were investigated by uh, economists over the uh, last uh, uh, 20 or 30 years, depending on which issue we are looking at. Uh, I have to go very quickly. I, have to, I will uh, really put all my points together here. Okay, a big thing, and this is a, a very important point I want to make. A big thing in all this is a question being asked by, uh, which was asked by Amartya Sen in a very well-known paper, which was inequality of what? And everything there. When we talk about inequality and development, inequality and growth, uh, in general, people are not clear about what kind of inequality are we talking about. Are we talking about inequality of income? Are we talking about inequality of wealth? Are we talking about uh, inequality of people in front of the labor market? Are we talking about inequality of uh, people in front of the educational system? What it is? So this is uh, uh, important. And lately, very much emphasis has been put after looking at the capabilities introduced by Sen, uh, saying that income inequality is not really what matters. What matters is the income of the capabilities, what people can do, given the resources that are available uh, to them and uh, uh, the very uh, uh, close uh, concept, which are opportunities introduced or uh, very much formalized by uh, John uh, Rummer. Uh, and uh, uh, the difference between those concepts is absolutely uh, uh, abysmal. Inequality versus relative poverty. Should we look at the Gini, which is taking into account the whole inequality? Some people are very satisfied saying, no, we want to look at only the bottom part of the distribution. And uh, we should look only at the share of the bottom X percent. And uh, today, the uh, last motto of the World Bank is uh, shared prosperity, which is let's look only at the average income of the bottom 40 percent of uh, the population. Absolute versus relative uh, inequality. What does it matter? Does it matter that my income is now 50% of the income of my neighbor? Or is it what matters the fact that today I am earning uh, X uh, euros less than my neighbor? Uh, we see that uh, uh, if uh, the economy is growing, the same relative inequality will correspond to more and more absolute inequality. And maybe this is what people have in mind. It is interesting to notice that uh, the aggregate welfare index that Sen has proposed one day to take into account both aggregate uh, growth and uh, inequality was to multiply uh, average income or GDP per capita by one minus the Gini coefficient. What you have behind that is a concept of a Y bar minus absolute inequality, which would be the Gini coefficient multiplied by Y bar. And it is also interesting that uh, uh, when we talk about inequality uh, per se, or the lack of inequality as good thing per se, it is interesting that in the high level um, panel uh, on the post-2015 agenda, there is this recommendation that inequality per se, uh, or less inequality per se, should be uh, an objective in the post-2015 agenda. The second thing is, I will not get into those figures, uh, don't, uh, don't worry, don't be afraid. Uh, the second thing is inequality uh, being instrumental in the sense that it determines the way in which growth is being transformed into less poverty. And this is something that uh, people uh, uh, took a long time to realize. You know, uh, this uh, article by uh, David Dollar and Art Cray, which was saying uh, growth is good for the poor, so forget about inequality, look at growth, and that's it. Here I wanted to insist on the fact that inequality is important. What you have on the, those regressions 
is a naive model says the change in inequality, in poverty, uh, depends only on the change in the mean income of the population. This is the first uh, column, naive model. And you find that there is a coefficient which is equal to minus 1.6. So the elasticity, poverty versus income is 1.6, highly significant. And this is the kind of uh, figure that everybody would uh, take on board. But the second regression, the standard model, simply adds to that the change in the inequality. And say, okay, if at the same time you have growth, inequality is increasing, then most likely poverty will not go down as much as in the first case. And indeed, you find that uh, the coefficient associated with the variation in the Gini coefficient is positive. So if you're in a country where you have growth and at the same time more inequality, for example, China, then you have a positive impact on uh, uh, the reduction of poverty, but you also have a negative impact on the reduction of poverty. And you can go on. You can say, okay, things are slightly more, uh, more complicated. The elasticity with respect to income depends itself on the degree of inequality in the economy or depends itself on the, uh, how poor the economy is. And you can move on to the uh, following columns. I will not do that. Uh, uh, but uh, you see there that uh, poverty reduction is related to growth in a not so difficult way, but in a way that depends very, very much on what is going on on the inequality uh, front. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't think that in my life I ever got uh, this kind of regression where absolutely everything is uh, super significant. Uh, the only thing is that these regressions are very, very close to an identity. So it's very nice to see that uh, uh, the data seems to, uh, uh, seem to uh, confirm that there is an identity between the change in inequality and all those, those variables. Last point on last uh, way of looking at uh, the relationship between inequality and growth was the old way we had this uh, uh, well-known Kuznets curve hypothesis where Kuznets had said in the first stage growth is generating more inequality, in the second stage it's generating less inequality. Many people have tried to uh, check whether this was true on a cross-country basis. Uh, the result uh, is not very robust in the redistribution with growth uh, uh, volume. There was this very well-known paper by Montek and Uvalia about, uh, about this. Uh, and uh, if we were to look at only one country, what is going on these days in developed countries definitely shows that uh, we don't have a, 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 a Kuznets curve, we don't have an inverted U curve. Uh, we may have uh, something like a tilde, uh, we may have, uh, but uh, definitely inequality is increasing again, so this is certainly not uh, something which we can rely on. There is also the opposite relationship. If growth produce uh, ambiguous result on the degree of inequality of income, isn't it the case that inequality of income is producing uh, some uh, effect on the rate of growth? And this is really the literature which was very, very important in the 90s. And uh, uh, inequality had a positive or negative uh, impact on uh, growth through various channels. You had the old Caldor argument, rich people save more than poor people, so more inequality is good because there will be more savings in the economy and more investment in the economy. Then you had people taking a completely opposite view, saying that what is bad with inequality is that people will not accept inequality. They will want to redistribute. And in redistributing, they will generate some inefficiency. If they redistribute in a violent way, for example, crime, some people try to see whether there was a relationship between inequality and the degree of crime, then clearly this is something which is very costly. But even if you look at uh, democracies where people have to vote on uh, the degree of redistribution in the uh, economy, uh, then uh, you can show that the more unequal the country, the more redistribution will be voted by the median voter or by the by votal voter, it is if the parental voter is below the average, and this will generate more uh, taxes, and the uh, taxes are not uh, uh, very uh, good for uh, growth and for accumulation. So uh, we had a kind of uh, uh, theoretical model to explain the way in which 
uh, redistribution was endogenous, reacting to too much inequality, and was inimical to growth. Maybe the most important uh, uh, argument was unequal access to markets, and the most important one being credit. The fact that uh, uh, a poor person has no collateral to get a credit, but yet has a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, investment project, will not uh, realize that project because uh, uh, it cannot get credit. And somebody else who has the wealth, who has uh, the right uh, uh, connection, will be able to get a credit or will be able to finance a project which will be mediocre. This means that uh, there is something inefficient in that economy and it will be much better for the rich guy to uh, lend or to uh, make uh, capital available to the poor guy so that the most profitable project is undertaken. A lot can be done in that direction. You can analyze uh, uh, unequal access to education. Uh, this is the same kind of argument. And all this is completely uh, inefficient. So from that point of view, we have a good argument to show that some kind of inequality is generating inefficiency in the economy and probably generating less growth in those economies. This has been formalized by uh, all uh, those people. This is the literature of the 90s. I don't insist on this. Unequal access to markets can be generalized. If you look at discrimination on the labor markets, it is the same thing. If uh, 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 women are discriminated, then they will make less efforts in order to get the right jobs or to get uh, higher up in the hierarchy. If uh, some ethnic group is discriminated, this group will not make uh, efforts in order to uh, uh, be uh, better because they know that in any case they will not be able to get the uh, wage uh, or the salaries that uh, they deserve. So we can multiply this idea of unequal access to markets uh, in many, many ways and uh, we'll get the same kind of result that this inequality uh, or this market imperfections is generating some uh, inefficiency and is inimical to growth. Aggregate demand channel, this is an old paper by Murphy, Schleifer and Vishni, where uh, they show that if you have increasing return to scale in, uh, uh, in mass consumption, and if you have a, a very uh, uh, regressive income distribution, there will be little demand for that uh, good, and therefore the economy will not be able to exploit the economies of scale, and they will not be able to make productivity progress uh, that uh, would be possible with a more equal uh, distribution of income. I think that uh, this uh, argument has been more or less ignored because with uh, opening up, with globalization, with uh, all these economies being completely open, then this argument of uh, limited demand is uh, not uh, completely uh, uh, credible. And finally, we have institutions. What do we have been behind institutions? We have, again, a distribution, an inequality, a fundamental inequality, uh, which is that if you are in a country with a predatory elite, uh, with the, the uh, objective of which is essentially to get richer and to steal from uh, the uh, rest of the population, uh, then, of course, uh, that economy will not uh, be able to uh, grow in the sense that uh, there will be no investment uh, and the uh, elite doesn't care at all about the development of the country. If, on the contrary, you're in a country where the elite has an interest for development, maybe it's all interest, uh, but also an interest for the population uh, becoming uh, less uh, poor uh, and uh, uh, accessing a higher level of standard of living, then things will be completely different. Now, what is behind that? What is behind that is inequality of a very specific uh, factor, which is political power. In one case, you have a very unequal distribution of political power. A few people can rule the whole economy. In the other case, you have something which may be closer to a democracy, even though it may not be a democracy, and there is a huge difference between those two cases. But again, we are talking about some kind of inequality. So these are the various channels through which people uh, started to understand that inequality was uh, something which was bad per se, but also inequality was bad because it was reducing the capacity for an economy of growing. All these channels correspond to different definitions of inequality. When I was saying a little earlier, inequality of what? This is the case. You may have income, 
like in the uh, uh, consumption story and economies of scale story, uh, uh, or the uh, income redistribution story, it may be wealth or the collateral that people may have on the credit market, it may be access to non-discriminated job, it may be political power, every, every one of them is a different uh, uh, dimension of inequality. So that when we summarize the uh, uh, analysis of growth and income inequality and inequality to income inequality, we are making a very, very uh, rough uh, approximation which uh, has a uh, all chance to be to lead to uh, fallacious uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, okay, they are all correlated, probably they are correlated, but uh, this is not uh, a reason to uh, make a confusion between uh, them. And the point is that it is necessary to identify which kind of inequality is important if we want to uh, foster growth. If we uh, know that, uh, uh, I believe this is the point uh, that I'm making here, if we know that the problem comes from a very heavy, very strong wage discrimination on uh, the labor market. And because of that, some people say, okay, because I'm so much discriminated, I'm not going to work. And therefore, you have a drop in the labor supply in the whole economy. If you do that, will you be able to correct this by income redistribution? No, it will have no impact. Or if you say that uh, income inequality, uh, uh, inequality comes from inequality in, edu in education, and because of that, you have very much inequality in education, this is generating more inequality, inequality in income, and this is generat generating fast, uh, slower growth. Will you be able to solve everything by redistributing from the rich to the poor? No, that's not the point. What you should do is to take from some people, maybe the rich, and invest in education of the poor. And this is a completely different story. And this is where uh, we are at this stage a little unclear about how to interpret all that literature on uh, the relationship between growth and inequality. In particular, all this very voluminous literature on the cross-country empirics, this is not very robust. Uh, some people say in the short run, uh, the relationship is uh, uh, positive between inequality and growth. Uh, in the long run, it is negative. There is a recent study by Austri and Al at the IMF. It is quite uh, surprising now to see that the IMF is uh, uh, investing in this kind of uh, uh, analysis where they show that, uh, yes, uh, inequality uh, uh, sem seems to have a negative impact on growth, and at the same time that redistribution has no impact whatsoever. So they conclude, let's redistribute, and uh, that's it. But of course, I mean, uh, if uh, you say in a country the Gini coefficient is... Uh, uh, point uh, uh, 45, let's look at Brazil, point 55, which is very, very high. And let's have Brazil at the same level of inequality as the US. So they would go from point 55 to point 37. Can we imagine that there would be an income redistribution that would not produce a complete disaster in the uh, Brazilian economy? So what we can get from this is not clear. We have to go much deeper in the uh, causes which are there. I'm almost done. <laughs> Two slides to go. <laughs> this is where the inequality of opportunity story comes in. Many of the channels through which I uh, went, uh, about the way in which uh, uh, inequality, quote unquote, because we don't know the inequality of what it is, affect growth, refer to opportunities, refer to circumstances. I have wealth. I have uh, parents uh, who have some collateral. Who, uh, or who can pay for my studies, who can go to a bank and get, uh, uh, get a, a, a credit. Uh, I, am, I belong to uh, some uh, ethnic groups, etc. This is circumstances which I don't have any control uh, uh, over, and uh, 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 therefore, uh, this is simply what uh, I've been given. This, is, this corresponds very much with the capabilities uh, of SEN. And this is really what matters uh, to explain the role that inequality may have uh, on, uh, on, on, on growth. So inequality of opportunity determines both income inequality and uh, growth. So with this, I'm getting back uh, to uh, Dudley Sears and his, uh, uh, first, and his, uh, his point about extending uh, uh, development economics beyond national income, we see that behind changes in 
the inequality of opportunity, this is social progress. If we say that tomorrow it is possible for uh, people in a poor uh, uh, part of a big metropolis in a developing country will be getting quality education or better quality in their education, this is equalizing opportunities. And uh, this would be considered as, at the same time, as something good, as something fair. It is only fair that the poor people would have access to the same kind of uh, schooling as uh, uh, rich uh, uh, people. So what is interesting here is that we see that uh, when we understood that inequality of opportunity had something to do with growth, the case is that social progress in general cannot be considered as independent of growth. It is good to pursue social progress per se, but at the same time, it is good because this will have a favorable effect on, uh, on, on growth. Now, uh, you could say that this is uh, very good. This is like a free lunch. Uh, let's uh, improve education among the poor people and everything will be better. The only problem is that we have to pay for that. And then we, to pay for that, we have to raise taxes or we have to uh, cut on some kind of public expenditure, like in infrastructure, and this has a cost. Maybe too much taxes will reduce incentives of some people to save or to invest uh, or to uh, uh, work or to be very uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, and, of course, uh, uh, reducing public expenditures in some area uh, will have a, a, different, a, a, a direct cost. So, Things are not that simple. I mean, social progress is good per se. It's good because it fosters growth, but we have to pay for it. And when we pay for it, there may be an efficiency cost, which means that the whole story about uh, the trade-off between efficiency and equity and, uh, 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 is not completely ignored. The only thing that all this analysis has introduced is the fact that in the old story about trade-off between equality and efficiency, people were looking at equity, good per se, and efficiency. Now we have something else. It is equity, good per se, fostering growth, and possibly the cost of uh, uh, raising the money. So we have added one term, which is modifying the trade-off between uh, 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 efficiency and equity. Conclusion. Overall, I would say that going back to the quote I gave of uh, Dudley here at the beginning, I would say that a sea change uh, has taken place in development economics over the last uh, 50 years. And it is fortunate. If not, I don't think that uh, we should be a little uh, worried about what we do here today and uh, what we have been doing over the last uh, 50 years. It took a long time to seriously start extending the analytical and empirical framework beyond GDP that was recommended by uh, the Glaciers. Uh, it, I think it is quite interesting to see that not a long time ago, a report was produced by uh, two Nobel Prizes and uh, not a Nobel Prize, uh, a French uh, economist. So the two Nobel Prizes were Sen and Stiglitz and the French economist was fit to see. And uh, this was a report which was uh, commissioned by uh, President Sarkozy and the report was simply called Going Beyond GDP. And it was really about measuring social, pro measuring social progress, not relying on GDP. So it's quite nice to see that 50 years or 40 years later, then uh, people are really very serious about this. Now, although it is a daunting endeavor, I would say that things are on the way in trying to understand uh, and trying to integrate uh, both economic and social concerns, uh, especially in the field of equity or inequality, within growth analysis. So uh, the kind of uh, uh, joint or uh, simultaneous uh, uh, treatment of uh, various dimensions of development that uh, Dudley Sears was uh, calling for, I think, is being realized. Now, we are only at the beginning. We don't have the data that we would need. It will be uh, it will take a very, very long time before we get to something uh, maybe more uh, substantial, but at least it is satisfactory to see that we made, we took the step, and we are really in this. Now, progress has also been made in an erratic way on the macro side. 
uh, forgetting about uh, inequality and equity and the social, uh, uh, social uh, concerns. Today, at least, we're recognizing market failures. We also introduced political economy analysis within the analysis of uh, growth. Uh, and uh, political economy analysis basically is recognizing that there are state uh, failures. So the way in which we look today at uh, uh, growth is not really the simplistic way we did back in the 50s and the 60s or back in uh, the uh, 90s where we believe to in the overall uh, uh, power of, uh, of markets. So overall, we seem to be on the right track on the analytics. Yet, the problem is that I don't think that we have found the policy levers that will actually permit the full eradication of income and non-income poverty. But I think what I mean is that for the moment we are observers, we are analysts, and we are still far away of telling policymakers here are the instruments that you could use in order to improve uh, equity opportunities and at the same time to foster growth. Thank you very much. That was truly a tour de force, uh, a wonderful tribute building on Dudley, but in so many ways going beyond and uh, drawing on uh, your own uh, brilliant expertise and involvement in many of these points. May I suggest that we have just two minutes where you buzz to your neighbor and give Francois just a chance to um, get ready for some responses to questions. So if you just turn to your neighbor, um, if your neighbor is a non-economist, find out whether they were sort how, anyway. Buzz. No, that was very good. I was, I must say, it drives me crazy what Europe is putting itself through. And, uh, you know, so many of the points you're making are just ignored in the way, at least in Britain, the neoliberal orthodoxy is... is and I was going to win triumphing. the election. <laughs> Sorry? They are triumphing. No, yes. you say that? Triumph yes, triumphal. Triumphal, yes. Yeah. No, triumphant, triumphant. Yes. No, it's really... Um, uh, but don't you think that... Uh, I'm a bit sad that people are leaving. Yeah, okay, fine. Yes, but that we're going to be see more serious people are going to stay behind. Uh, don't you think that uh, things are changing slightly? No. In, in, in England, I have the feeling that uh, change, uh, things are not changing very much. That no. you still have the dominating uh, neoliberal view. So, and no, we're even more. And, Here. and I don't know why the Labour Party won't challenge them. Was, only the Greens are challenging. Yeah. It's very strange. It's very yeah. strange. Okay. I hope that has given you... Now it's your turn, as they say. And we're going to take two or three or perhaps even four comments, depending on questions, depending on whether they're too long and too long. Ray, please. Do you need it? Yes. There we are. Good. I hesitate to depart from a tour de force. Uh, I'm a, a minnow in the economics profession compared to you, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll pretend I'm a piranha. Uh, I think you were welcomely historical in going back from the 60s to 2012, but I wonder whether you were being ahistorical at the same time, because there's an assumption somehow there that each of your three periods are marked by a crisis of one sort or another, and then we move on to a different trajectory. And I think what we're seeing unfolding at the moment is much more substantial than the crisis of the 1982 or indeed the financial crisis of 1988. I think we're at the stage of a paradigm crisis, that the paradise of a paradigm of accumulation we're witnessing at the moment is a very substantial paradigm crisis and it is of a socio-technical nature, uh, and it is not amenable to the policy levers which you suggest. And I want to draw just your attention to two people who worked on this, 
your colleague Thomas Piketty, who says we've now moved to the stage where the rate of return is greater than rate of economic growth as we've exhausted the easy stages of catch-up. And the second person is Carlotta Perez, who some of you might know, a Venezuelan economist, who really works on 50-year cycles of long-run growth. She goes, she's in the conjunctive Chris Freeman story, and she's really talking about the exhaustion of the mass production paradigm. And I think the crisis we're observing, which is around political fracture, it's not just a crisis of a crisis of growth rate in the north. It's a much more substantial, the old model doesn't work. And I, I'm wondering whether you're tinkering at the edges with your policy responses rather than us. Think of the green issue, the whole paradigm decimation of the environment. This is a non-trivial set of issues confronting us. And I think the economic literature which you've drawn on and which you're so much on top of, I don't think begins to scratch the surface of the necessary response. Well, good. Let me go back. I think that was so clear. Thank you, Ray Pete. Perhaps you'd comment right away on that, okay. and then, then we'll get to questions. Uh, okay, no, thank you very much for the, for, for, for the comment. But uh, you'll have noticed that uh, I talked about uh, developing countries, and I don't think that the issue for, developing can for developed countries is exactly the same. Uh, I uh, tend to agree with you that uh, uh, developed countries today are in front of uh, uh, very... Uh, uh, very uh, a terrible difficulty which may uh, lead to a paradig paradigmatic change or in any case uh, will require uh, an adjustment which will be uh, very, very painful. In terms of uh, paradigma paradigmatic change, it is quite clear that uh, this uh, crisis has shown that uh, markets uh, could not uh, work uh, so as to uh, uh, clear or to uh, settle things uh, automatically. I think that there are many theorists who knew that uh, for a very long time. Many people who have uh, who uh, criticized uh, the uh, hypothesis or the assumption of uh, rational expectations, saying that there is no, no not such a thing as rational expectation. It works when uh, nothing happens, but as soon as there is a shock then uh, uh, expectations cannot be rational and uh, we can get the kind of uh, crisis that, uh, that, 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 we, that we had. Now, is it okay that uh, the reforms which are being uh, implemented in the financial sector will be enough? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this is uh, uh, simply by increasing the, the uh, capital requirement in, uh, in big banks uh, we have solved everything. It is still the case that... Uh, uh, many, many banks are too big to fail, uh, that uh, they, have, uh, they are living on, the, on the huge uh, rents. And uh, from that point of view, yes, I think that you're right. There is something to be, uh, to be done, and uh, it is not clear uh, uh, whether we are aware of uh, what, uh, what should be done. And there is another aspect, which is the fact that uh, those countries are going independently from the uh, kind of crisis and the importance of the financial sector, those countries are going through uh, a structural adjustment, which is, which is uh, very hard, which is that uh, you have deindustrialization. Uh, even in this country, in Germany, it is okay that uh, the manufacturing sector is more or less constant in terms of the share of GDP, but when you look at employment, uh, employment has gone down by 50% in uh, Germany over the last 20 years in manufacturing. So what do you do with, uh, with all these people? So, it is clear from my point of view that we have this kind of uh, difficulty in developed countries. Now, in developing countries, things are not exactly the same. Uh, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis, didn't affect in the same way developing countries. Some countries, some banks were exposed to the same kind of risk, but you didn't have the same kind of uh, uh, craziness uh, in, in, in those countries. And uh, the, the, the path in front of them and uh, uh, the fact that they can still rely on imitating and uh, adapting rather than innovating in order to generate growth is making things uh, rather, uh, rather different. So I would tend to agree with you as far as developed countries are concerned, and this was not at all my topic today, uh, I'm not sure about uh, developing countries. Thank you. Now, uh, was it uh, Gabriel? Uh, thank you, Professor Bourguignon. That was very enlightening, but it's left me puzzled. Uh, 
Because your last sentence was um, that we don't really have um, answers to what policies would be necessary to address the issues. And even if we're only speaking about developing countries, I think there are a lot of policy answers out there, and I've, I would appreciate your reaction to them. There's a pr proposal for a global social protection floor, which would not eradicate poverty, but at least alleviate the worst forms of income poverty. There's a lot of discussion now in the discussion on, on what to happen after post-2015 on decent work and employment, um, how to generate growth with jobs or even no growth, but to redistribute jobs. And so I'd be very keen to know what you know, you're thinking on that in the context of planetary boundaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to now take, very good. Can we take a few more? Yes, please. And then someone decides. Oh, and someone way at the back. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to follow up a little bit on that, on policies, and kind of try to draw what you said in the first part with the second part. You said in the first part that we've moved to the role of institutions. And then somewhere you said that you have come up to saying that politics really matter. Because institutions, the way you've presented it, were almost exogenous, that they came. But institutions are endogenous. They are shaped by strategic actors. And the I think what, is, what was missing, and maybe it leads to the policy levers, is what are the new actors? Who are the new actors that are coming up? And what is the bargaining? How has this bargaining power between these actors have changed? And as I hope we will say tomorrow in the plenary, in my view, there are two major changes. One is the role of financial capital and the importance of financial capital, which is a big issue, not only for developed countries, but for developing countries. If you see a non-performing loans of developing countries, the moment that a private sector develops in a developing country, non-performing loans start increasing tremendously because of practices of the banking sector. Yep. Uh, so one is that. Secondly, in terms of policy levers, you said taxes, if we, uh, taxes uh, are costly, yes. But why not try at least in terms of tax havens and tax avoidance? So you get global governance reforms that could go a long way towards kind of um, addressing these issues of uh, different um, negotiating power of the different strategic actors behind institutions. And I think we have moved to that, to a new regime where we need to address the politics of a globalization. Thank you. Let's take right at the back, and then we'll have you would come to our, yes. Yeah, um, I just have a, a quick comment. On, it's more on the, less on the policy, and more on the history of economic uh, ideas, because I was, I admit I was uh, perplexed by the t your title, that you chose 50 years of development economics, when, for instance, this year we could have talked about the 60th anniversary of Arthur Lewis, for instance, or the 70th anniversary of some of the early work by Rosenstein Rodin. And in particular, this is a lecture in the name of Dudley Sears, who is a professed structuralist and was part of that early generation who were so formative. But as you say, there's been a sea change in, in development economics, and part of that sea change has been the, erase, the, the erasing of, of the memory of, in the field of economics of many of these key pioneer, pioneering thinkers. And what struck me in your presentation, although you know, I'm sure if we discuss in person, you would, <laughs> we'd share a lot, lot of common uh, thoughts on this, but is that is this presentation of a sort of consensus, uh, sort of an evolving consensus with some degree of debate, but nonetheless, that's very much a main key, mainstream consensus that has been the mainstream that has erased a lot of these older sort of wisdoms from the field. Uh, that I'm afraid that they actually had a lot of insight and a lot of messages that are very pertinent to today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If you'd like to bring some, then get ready because we're going to then give this to the group. Okay, uh, again, thank you very much for these uh, this, uh, comments. Uh, on the, this issue of the, of the policy levers, uh, first, uh, I talked only about the countries themselves. I didn't talk at all about global governance and global policy levers. And uh, let me at this stage be a little skeptical about uh, controlling capital flights and uh, uh, controlling tax havens at this stage. Maybe 
things are changing, and from that point of view, the U.S. initiative, uh, followed by uh, Europe, is fantastic. I mean, this is one of the good news of uh, the last uh, maybe uh, uh, 20 years, but uh, we are still far, very far away from uh, controlling capital flights from, uh, uh, from developing countries. So uh, I was really referring to levers in uh, developing countries. Now, I didn't say that there was no lever. There are, of course. I mean, you are talking about social protection. Of course, that you have to do social protection. Uh, there are, uh, we have seen some innovations in uh, several countries. We have seen uh, 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 minimum pensions uh, uh, paid to uh, people who didn't have uh, uh, social security. We have seen uh, conditional cash transfers. We have seen many, many things. And this is great. This is fantastic. And uh, we are making uh, progress in uh, many countries in terms of trying to uh, 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 level uh, the uh, educational system so that uh, people have access to, there is less uh, differences in terms of the quality of schooling. I'm not uh, disputing that. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. And uh, of course, we have to move in and to go in that direction. The point is that in some areas, it, things are more, are more difficult. When you, for example, jobs and the way in which you can uh, create them, okay, I uh, would like to see, and uh, at this stage I would say I would be uh, rather skeptical on this, but there is still, and uh, maybe I should uh, have made uh, this point much clearer, one of the reasons why the levers are uh, difficult in the sense that if we believe that in many countries, uh, because of the principle of sovereignty, you cannot impose anything to that country. And you have, you are in front of uh, some uh, elite uh, which is uh, more or less uh, predatory. Uh, you cannot expect this elite to uh, make uh, uh, policy changes that will be in favor of uh, the agenda that, uh, that I have sketched. Then what can we do? And uh, uh, look, I mean, I had a conference uh, uh, seminar uh, last week in, uh, in Paris and uh, there were several people, in particular people from some uh, development agencies. And at some stage we had a discussion about in all the countries where you are present in Africa, uh, tell us how many countries are there that you are confident in uh, the uh, rulers. And you know that the rulers will do things to improve and to go in the direction of they say two. And okay, fine, and uh, it's not very difficult to find out who, uh, which are the two. But uh, this is what we're facing. And uh, so we have this framework. We know that uh, we should go in some direction and uh, by doing this and that, uh, uh, things would, be, uh, would improve. But we are facing the most fundamental inequality which is this uh, political power inequality. And the fact that uh, because uh, uh, aid, public aid is going from uh, sovereign to sovereign uh, and cannot go through uh, uh, to N uh, NGOs or uh, organizations like that, uh, we know that uh, we are very, very limited. And at the same time, we know that in those countries, there are poor people, there are things to do. And most likely, those countries in those countries, it will be more difficult to develop than in the others. So in terms of needs, this is where we should go. And uh, this is where I'm saying that policy levers, in many cases, are simply missing to address uh, some kind of, uh, of, of, of issue. On uh, the history of uh, economic thought and development, I completely agree with you. I mean, I should have started with uh, the, the fathers of uh, uh, development economics and uh, the Rosenstein Rodin and the Singer and the Hirschman, uh, etc., uh, who, you're right, were uh, uh, certainly in comparison with, uh, with the today's mainstream, uh, certainly uh, um, uh, very uh, heterodox. At the same time, when you look at the way in which those people were looking at uh, development, this was very much a planning view. They were taking into account the fact that there were specificities, that there were social issues, that development was not only uh, maximizing uh, income, but their view was really, we have countries, we have to manage, we have to invest, we have to uh, 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 um, allocate 
resources such that this, this uh, economy will be growing. I mean, remember Hirschman and uh, the forward and backward linkages. What is it? This is planning. So, uh, the, and I would say that from a macro point of view, what was dominating uh, in the thought of those people was more that. So, they were the founders of uh, the discipline. Uh, great guys, have no doubt about this. Uh, they also had uh, some of them the same ideas as uh, Dudley Sears, which I've singled out because this was a Dudley Sears uh, uh, lecture. But I'm not sure that if I were to uh, go from 50 years to 60 years, the view would be fundamentally different. But this is something that can be discussed. Thank you very much. Let's, let's have a final three questions here. I'm conscious that we're getting near to 10. I'm not sure when the bar closes, but I'm <laughs> Would anyone hit? Yes, please. That's Francois, Nancy Birdsall, Center for Sorry, Global I Development. That's okay, Richard. Uh, I liked your three stages of development, perhaps amended slightly by this <coughs> further nuance on the structuralist view. But, and I liked Luca's politics of globalization. And I'd just like to suggests that next time you have a fourth stage of development economics, which is when we have to face the reality of a completely globalized, interconnected system in which it's the politics stupid really does matter. And the problem, as Luca suggested and as you suggested, is that we have, a, we have states, but we don't have a global polity. So coming from the World Bank after all those years here, I hope your next, fourth, your next lecture will have a fourth stage, which is development economics is becoming so much about global risks and global opportunities, climate, migration, the tax issue, and so on. I think that's where the field will go more and more. Maybe you have something you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's the erosion okay, of the very, sovereign very this century. Final, but ten, uh, any of you want to That's it. Yes, yeah, that's the end. Good, good point. Uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, we have been uh, very uh, good friends and uh, old friends with uh, Nancy. So uh, maybe by courtesy, I should leave her the last word. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, Nancy, uh, you are, you're absolutely right. It, it is true that uh, globalization is introducing uh, a set of additional constraints on, uh, on, on countries. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure it is a, f a fourth stage. It is a third stage uh, where I should have insisted on the fact that this third stage was also the stage of globalization because it is not uh, something which uh, will happen in, in the future. It's, it's already there. It is already the case that uh, uh, capital, uh, it's already the case. Capital uh, flight has gone, uh, have been going on for quite some time in, uh, in, in, in uh, developing countries. I mean, remember the, the, the way in which uh, Nigeria, uh, you were involved in, uh, in this. Uh, Nigeria was uh, able to get uh, back a part of uh, uh, Abasha's uh, uh, wealth, which was invested in, uh, in, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, so, uh, no, you're right. I mean, I think that this is a point on which I wish, uh, the, the third stage has an additional dimension, which is definitely globalization. Uh, the way in which it, uh, it plays a role is... Uh, I'm not completely clear about, uh, about, about this. Uh, because at the same time, it gives opportunities uh, to uh, some countries. Uh, and at the same time, it reduces the opportunities. So the balance of all this is not, uh, is, is, is not clear. And uh, in terms of policy levers, I'm not completely convinced that uh, globalization is uh, eliminating uh, policy levers. I mean, they still have, uh, even though our economies are globalizing, there is still uh, some uh, domestic uh, issues and domestic uh, uh, domains where uh, policy remains, remains important. But you're right. I mean, next, uh, next uh, lecture I will do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay,